What's up, gangsters? I am super out of practice at this, but it is finally time for another episode in the Tiny Tank Adventure. This one is going to go through pretty much the whole painting process, just getting all the colors down. So, without any further lip flapping on my part, let's just get into it and see what we've got here. Okay, so here we go. I am carrying on with the Tiny Sherman project, and uh, I've actually completed one piece. <laughs> yes, progress is uh, happening at a at a at a maddening pace. We're just out of control here at Rube Goldberg Enterprises. Anyway, uh, yeah, this one little thing, this uh, shelf thing that goes on the front of the tank I just decided come on focus up there I just decided to start with that because I thought that making the rust would be fun and of course it was and uh, I know that um, mostly the little shelves on these were made out of wood but that's boring and I felt like since the motif with this thing was for the applique armor to be this made out of this, uh, you know, rusty six inch channel that it made sense to make the little shelf out of a piece of it as well. So that's the story there and I'm sticking to it. So. This basically has just been uh, also just fun rust practice. And I did a lot of it here on the applique armor as well, just to kind of warm up and get myself kind of, you know, in the right mode for a nice rusty, splotchy finish. And what I kind of, here's my reference that I was using. Let me find it on my phone. Uh, this thing here just you know from the old Googles and I think it's a great representation of not only what you know a piece of rusty iron that's been laying outside for a while looks like uh, but it is gonna work well with the color palette for this tank because orange and green always tend to work well together so I was trying to kind of duplicate that and I wanted to really get some splotches. And so I um, started out using uh, the, I've got the whole set of uh, MRP rust colors. Um, but as usual, I just wasn't super stoked. And so I just ended up kind of blending my own rust base and that's what's in this bottle and it's just a bunch of those tones work together to kind of give me the base the basic medium tone that I wanted to lay down and then just build layers off of not uh, super dark definitely rusty enough orange and let's see, let's kind of compare it to the picture. And you can kind of see where I was going there. It's a little lighter. And looking at it through the camera lens, it's not as good of a match as it is in real life. That's kind of weird. The uh, camera lens is showing what's on my phone to be quite a bit uh, bluer and uh, denser more saturated anyway is what it is it works and so what I ended up doing with with it is just splattering spraying and splattering a bunch of different layers and just changing up the tones until I got pretty close to what I wanted and then I finished it off with some uh, ammo rust colored pigments you can kind of see on there and I'll go back and do one more application of the pigments uh, at, when I do the final assembly and I won't put any clear over it because that definitely dis diminishes the saturation of those rusty tones so anyway I'm pretty pretty happy with that 
And as far as these things go, so the story is that this is just your basic six inch steel channel that these guys found and it was, you know, rusty and they just started welding it to the side of the tank. And so as a welder, I know that um, that's a pretty good approximation of what it's going to look like. Those welds are going to be a bright steel color. Now, there are people who will tell you, well, welds don't rust. And look, as a general rule, that's just horse shit. It is true that a high nickel weld, like might have been used, probably was used, to weld the tank itself together. And like you would find, you know, right there. Yeah, that's never going to rust maybe not even 70 years later. But I can tell you as a farm boy welder that the kind of utility rod that a mechanic would be likely to be using in the field to construct something like this, you know, it's just like your everyday average 6011 farm rod and it absolutely will rust. So what I'm gonna do is th these are these have been painted and I've got a nice heavy coat of MRP super clear matte lacquer on it to kind of protect it and so my plan is that okay so these are gonna go on the side of the tiny Sherman let's see if I can sort of show this all right so they're gonna be on the side of the tiny Sherman like so and the idea is that the Sherman has a pretty new coat of baked on enamel from the factory that's not going to show much wear or chipping. But after this applique armor was put on, it got overpainted with some just basic green and black paint. And that's going to very much be chipped and scratched. And so some of these welds and some of this rust will show through. And when I do that, then I'll come back with a little rust wash to show how the welds rust because they do rust pretty quickly. So it'll show some of both, a, a sort of unrusted weld and a kind of, you know, rusty weld and some of those rust tones uh, coming through. So that's the plan there. Now, as you can see, I've also started painting some of the OD and I'm kind of poking around at that because as I mentioned, the initial OD that I put on all of the running gear and the bottom part of the tank was this SMS Olive Drab. And it's fine, but this is a good example of how much the base coat can affect uh, how something looks. Everything down here that I painted with this stuff was primed in black and you can see how dark it is and I really think it's too dark I mean it's probably actually pretty accurate for late war olive drab but I just I don't like it it's just kind of dead to me and I want the overall thing to be a little bit brighter so I've sprayed um, some MRP olive drab which is a pretty pretty similar tone and I honestly, I like MRP better. <coughs> this SMS is not bad paint, but <coughs> I just like MRP better. And so this MRP olive drab is pretty close to the same tone. And so just to see, because um, it's going to be covered up, it doesn't really matter, how if this looks on top of gray primer, that's what I shot right here on the sides. And you can see that it is really pretty light. Maybe too light, I don't know. Um, you know, there's always arguments about what uh, color this uh, olive drab actually is supposed to be. So, I don't know, I may darken that up a little bit, but you can see I've got a little bit of differentiation between the upper and the lower part, which I actually want, even though most of this is gonna get covered up with dirt. And so, I kind of feel like that probably what's going to happen is that I will, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I'm kind of working through this. 
I, I kind of want the upper surfaces to be lighter. I'm doing a little bit of modulation and, and in that interest, I did a little bit of pre-shading on this thing. And I don't know if this makes sense or if this is gonna work, but I kind of want to bring out that texture. And so you can see I've pre-shaded from underneath, kind of the opposite of zenithal shading, so that the shadows are a little thicker. And I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna spray the green over that. And I kind of darkened this where there might be a lot of handling and you know, just grime around these hatches. So I don't know, we'll see. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because um, I can just paint over the whole thing with a better shade if I end up not liking how it's turning out. But there's gonna be a lot of green and I wanna break it up as much as possible. And one of the ways I'm gonna do that is with the gas cans uh, that are gonna be on that back uh, luggage rack. So you can see, I'm kind of setting up for that and I'm, this, the side light from the sun is kind of making it hard to see. But these gas cans are gonna be varying from like brand new dark green uh, to lighter green with, now, with maybe just a little bit of chipping around the handles to um, darker green chipped and then one that's gonna just be rusty and just absolutely beat to shit out on the outside where you can see it. So um, this stuff, uh, all of these rusty pieces, they're all ready for some chipping fluid uh, once I get ready to uh, actually paint over them. But I gotta settle on the green color first, and so that's what's gonna happen next. Okay, so here's how that turned out. Basically, like I said, fuck around and find out. And you can very clearly see the difference as I showed you before between the wheels and the sides. And when I went ahead and just carried that overall and then did the turret, my sort of pre-shading I think was uh, effective. You can see that I'm getting a little bit more definition. Um, uh, I, it's still just a little too light. I just I took a look at some reference pictures and it's still just really a little bit too light. So. I'm going to just take that OD and I'm going to darken it down with a little bit of black. I mean, OD is basically just black and yellow. And uh, we'll see how that turns out. Okay, so here it is just a little bit later and this is the result. What I did was I mixed the same OD that I was using, like I said, with just a little bit of black, but I, I thinned it about 9 to 1, 10 to 1, um, to basically create a filter so I could just kind of sneak up on the tone that I wanted. And you can see it's just a little bit darker than what's on the wheels now. And I think overall it's a bit more eh, correct. I think the lighter tone would have been maybe okay for an older Sherman that was maybe a little bit faded. Um, but the truth is, the later war, as far as I know anyway, I'm not like an expert on any of this, but as far as I understand it, the later war Shermans had a darker a darker green OD. And in fact, in some pictures, it looks almost black. Uh, so, but I just don't want it that dark. I just, you know, gotta have some color. And no, it's not fucking scale effect. It's just, I just don't like it that light. So anyway, there it is. Um, and so now the plan is I'm going to stick these uh, applique armor bits on there permanently. Actually, I'll probably mask and paint the, the white stars first, but I'm going to stick those on there permanently, and then I'm going to apply chipping fluid, and then I'm going to spray the green and the black because I want it to basically happen the way that it would have happened in the field. So not only will that give me that well, not only will that set me up to do some sanding and some chipping on the on the paint that goes over this rusty steel, but it'll also give me a bit of overspray on the green, which I want. And then of course the black is going to carry up and around and you know across the the turret and some of the other parts. So that's what's going to happen next. I'm not showing any of this stuff on camera because honestly, 
you know, you guys know if you've watched any of my videos that I hate working on camera. I'm not good at it. I'm just too slow. And really kind of what I'm trying to do with this little series is not so much show technique, but just kind of more go through my decision-making process and show how that translates to the results for whatever they're worth. Okay, so next step was painting on some markings. Now, I could have used the decals. They are pretty straightforward um, and they don't have a lot of excess carrier film, but yeah, painted markings are always better. I won't even equivocate on that at all. So, especially when they're super easy, I didn't even have to scan these. I just went, downloaded a star shape, brought it into uh, the Silhouette Studio software and measured these so that I knew what size to make the new ones. And a few minutes later, I had uh, my, little, um, my little Silhouette portrait machine cutting some masks out of this Aura Mask 810. Maybe you can see them. There they are, just like that. This stuff is pretty good for uh, relatively flat surfaces, which these are, so that worked good. Um, and then I just uh, shot some MRP white on there, and uh, there we go. So, it's always nice when there's literally only three markings to apply. <laughs> Yeah, can't get much easier than that. Now, I don't ever like to work on camera, but here is a situation where I can because this is so straightforward, but I gotta get my Optivizer because I don't want to screw this up. And so let me see if I can get situated here. What I'm gonna do is demonstrate just one of the reasons, really I guess the main reason, why painted markings are so much better than decals. All right, so look, there's the star on the front. I want to do a little bit of natural wear and abrasion on that, so let's do it the way that it would actually happen, by wearing it and abrading it with this little piece of Infini 1500 grit sanding sponge in some gripper tweezers. Now, yeah, hopefully I can keep this on camera. It's really kind of a hassle to get everything on camera in focus and be able to see it through my Optivizer at the same time. So, okay, let's see what we got there. Take a look. Yeah, I don't like that at all. I may end up repainting that because, yeah, I went right through the olive drab and started to pick up some of the gray primer underneath, which obviously I don't want to do. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's that's how it goes sometimes. Um, it sort of surprises me that it uh, happened that quickly, but, you know, these things happen. No big deal. Just a little quick masking. I've got the masks right here, and I'll just touch up around that star and it will all be fine. Regardless, the next thing is going to be um, hairspray on these rusted parts and then spraying the green and the black on them and then the black that will carry all the way over to the rest of the thing. Um, and that's where I'll do a little bit more wear on these stars. I don't want to do it now because I want some of the white to come through where the black gets rubbed off. Okay, so that's fixed uh, a few minutes later. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really just doesn't bother me when it happens because it is so easy to fix. Just take the mask, stick it back on there, do a little bit of careful spraying. And since I was switching airbrushes to my uh, 0.2 millimeter 
point, what is it, whatever it is, 0 0.02 millimeter, whatever it is, 0 0.2 millimeter Franken brush. Um, I decided to use that as an excuse to do a little bit of post shading and uh, darken up some areas where, you know, there'd be lubricants or grimy hands or whatever, just as kind of preparation for uh, some weathering action and just all of those areas that stuff gets, uh, you know, dirty like that. And to lighten up uh, a couple of the wheels, because why not? Um, I, I did it with the uh, with the drive sprocket there and with a couple of the road wheels. It's pretty subtle, but, and you know, again, it ain't going to even be probably visible after uh, all of the things are done, but... I like to do stuff like that because it's a real low pressure way to practice tiny little spraying with my uh, with my tiny little spraying airbrush and it's just fun to do. Oh, and also um, I keep forgetting the name of the manufacturer of the brass barrel for the tiny freedom dispenser and if it'll focus you can see how sweet that is and i don't want to do that because these guys deserve credit um, and this is the company i can't remember where i ordered it from though it was some hobby shop uh, type thing in canada that i think uh bruce whirl or one of the other knowledgeable canadian armor modelers turned me on to anyway you can see i got two of them and uh, you can see just how really beautifully machined they are and that is the brand name okay it's like a week or two maybe later i don't know shit i've lost track of time i just have other stuff going on but i did get back to this and i did the paint on the sides uh, on the applique armor and the chipping and i swear Guys, I was going to do some of the chipping on camera, but I just, yeah, I, it, it's just too intense. I'm too much of a perfectionist, and once the momentum was going, I just couldn't make myself stop. And, you know, anyway, so let's take a look. You can already see the top. So the story with this thing is, I want it to be self-explanatory, but yeah, whatever. The story with this thing is that these dudes, um, and maybe they're third army, Guys, who knows? Patton was not a fan of uh, applique armor because he felt like that it made the tanks too heavy, sucked up excess fuel, and was hard on the drivetrains. But soldiers being soldiers, yeah, since when did they give a fuck what a general says when they're terrified of getting blown the fuck up by a German 88 millimeter shell? So, now it, it is. And it is true, okay, this, I think I've said this before, this thing is a bit of an anachronism because, first of all, if it was an HVSS Easy 8 with the exhaust shield, yeah, it's like, you know, probably post-January of 45. So, the likelihood of it having applique armor of any kind, yeah, pretty slim, of it being some steel channel iron, that's pretty redundant, isn't it? Steel channel iron. Anyway, the, the possibility of it being some scrap channel iron welded to the side of the thing, even lower. But welders and dudes who are desperate will often combine into weird solutions. And even though this was unlikely, unlikely ain't the same as never. And you guys know that I will wedge my projects into a very narrow slice of probability if it means that I can do something more interesting than the huge. So that's the story here. And hopefully it will tell itself well enough. I showed it on SMCG yesterday. <laughs> the response was, yeah. The lukewarm is probably being generous. Uh, I think that my photos were terrible for one thing. I think maybe people ex are like reading this, expecting it to be wood slats, but wood slats were a Pacific theater thing because the Japanese used some magnetic mines and, you know, reasons. Not in the European theater 
but this is also not something that anybody's ever seen in a reference photo as far as I know. Hell, it's not even something I've seen in a reference photo. But this, once again, is a could have been, a might have been, whatever you want to call it. And I have a collection of Sherman reference photos that do in fact show HVSS Easy 8s with applique. And some of it's pretty bizarre. It's only three or four photos, but hey, get away, fly. It only takes one to make the case as far as I'm concerned. So the story is found some, some lengths of uh, like, you know, six or eight inch channel iron, welded the shit out of it on here. And I'm, and I'm gonna have to really emphasize the welds even more than I have. And then was, you know, we're like, oh, well shit, we need to make it green. Where's some green paint? Oh no, we don't have any green paint. Hey guys, I saw some green paint over there in the corner of the guy's barn. Okay, let's get that and let's just spray it on there. Oh wow, that looks kind of like a John Deere tractor. Well, we don't care, it's green. Okay, and then sprayed some black over it and it's all pretty crappy paint, pretty poorly applied on a surface that wasn't clean to start with and then got walked all over and so we hairspray chipped the fuck out of it. And uh, I'm actually, honestly, I, you know, it takes me, it takes me a bit to decide that I'm happy with hairspray chipping. And I usually almost always go back and, and tweak on it a little bit. But I feel, honestly, pretty good about this. Um, this is what I wanted to do. This is the whole reason that I broke the rules with this applique armor thing. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see. I'm going to study on it a little bit more. But basically, I use my same Tresemme number three uh, medium hold fine mist that I decant and then put in my airbrush. Um, Frankenbrush in this case. Applied it, you know, just in these areas on the sides of the turret on the top. Then came back with same said tiny airbrush and did the... Uh, the, uh, I did green on everything, then I did the black. And I very purposefully did the green under the black so that my first step could be my favorite thing, a little bit of very controlled sanding that allows some of that green to show through in a very subtle but controlled way that you ain't gonna get with paint. Then I started attacking it with the, you know, the typical water and stiff brushes. In this case, um, I started with this Deerfoot stippler, then moved down to this one as I, be, as I needed to get a little bit more control, and then finished off in some specific areas with this little nubbin of a thing. Then the last thing, because as it turns out, that even though MRP is a tough as shit lacquer, it is affectable, is that a word? With mineral spirits, especially if it's a really, really, really thin layer, or if it's already been damaged some other way. So then I came back with a Q-tip with some mineral spirits on it, and I worked some very uh, you know specific areas where I wanted to just show a little bit more wearing through like right there on my very painstakingly 3D printed and applied casting number. And also over here on El Otro Lado, a little Spanish lingo there, uh, right there to let the star show through. So anyway, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm gonna study on it. This is the first time I've really examined it in the daylight since I did it yesterday. But I did all this work, all this chipping work. Like, I, I, I wait only as long as it takes me to clean the airbrush, put all the paint away, and get the water out, and get my tools, and get going. But I could still do more chipping today if I wanted to, but I just don't know if I want to. Um, you know, I kind of, I kind of, I don't know, you know? I mean, I, if, if anything, I might choose to actually go back and apply some more green paint to the edges of the armor where, where, where it's got overspray like you see back here. We'll see. Because I want it to really tell the story that this was hastily field sprayed and that there's remnants of that green paint in a lot of areas. But after that, the next thing is to 
come back uh, and put some paper underneath this tow cable and then come and very carefully use a brush and some lacquer thinner to clean the paint off of that steel cable. Okay, so here it is with a little more progress and I am actually not, you know, I'm not mad about it. Uh, what I've done since I did the, uh, the paint and chipping is I went ahead and added some Tamiya panel line wash, which really starts to liven things up. And as usual, I started with just the hard black on all the places that are like actual openings or, you know, doors or panels or things that move like the hatch, you know, these hatches, stuff like that. And then I'm probably going to come back when I get out the oils and do like some green in some other places. There's just not as much of it as there is on an airplane model, which is kind of nice. But uh, then I, uh, and I have to say, I, you know, I, I put, as always, I put the, I put my enamel panel liners on directly on the paint. And I know some guys say that they struggle removing it and maybe it's a difference in the kind of paint. I don't know, but... With MRP lacquers, I have zero issue rubbing that stuff off. Um, you know, I, I get a I like to get a Q-tip with just a whiff of mineral spirits in it, and it just it comes right off, super easy. Sometimes though, I will go I will actually blend it, kind of like Uncle Night Shift does. Martin is the master of of using a brush to wet blend his pin washes. And sometimes I'll do that, like there on that little round thing, to just give a little bit of an accent to those bolt heads and maybe keep that round thing a little darker. Anyway, so yeah. Then I hit it with a very thin layer of MRP Super Clear Matte. And when I say very thin, I mean it's really nice to spray straight out of the bottle, but I don't want to build up any thickness, and all I really want is to take the take any of that natural MRP lacquer sheen away so that I can get a really true look at all of the tones. And so I cut it at least 50-50 and, uh, and just spray a single thin layer on there, just enough to totally ungloss it and uh, lets me really see. Oh, and I forgot, I also did go back as I threatened to and added a little more of the <laughs> grass green overspray to really help sell the idea that that is in fact overspray. So anyway, hopefully we'll see. So that's that, that's where it's at. And now I gotta decide what to do next. I got a lot of brush painting to do, obviously. I gotta brush paint the tools and uh, some other things. So that may be what I tackle next, we'll see. Okay, so here we are, uh, yeah, again, a few weeks later. Um, I have just been kind of gradually picking away at this thing, and I think that I am actually done with what I consider to be all of the paint work. That, as you know, does include some of the weathering because of the chipping things, but the point with this whole segment was to just get through all of the colors all of the paint work, which, you know, included some paint destruction, uh, but not any of what some people might call the weathering. I think that's silly because to me, you know, paint destruction is also part of the weathering. But bottom line is, is that where I'm at now is no dirt or oil or really anything like that. So uh, let me just catch you up to where I'm at. Let me get a little pointer here and uh, we'll get through it. Um, one thing is I've got the tracks all painted. They're basically in what I would call a raw steel color and they are ready to go with all of the dirt and stuff on them. Uh, you can see that I finished all of the uh, brush painting that I talked about all the detail work. I've got um, all the jerry cans on here. I'm actually, uh, you know, pretty happy about the jerry cans. They, you know, were sort of, for me, one of the things about the project that I was most excited about uh, because I felt like that was going to be a chance to, you know, put in some really small scale controlled effects. And I'm, I'm pretty stoked with them. You can see that 
I've got some color variation and as I was saying before you know I wanted to get a uh, kind of a spread from a pretty much brand new one over here on the left to a really roached out one over here on the other side and uh, I did the basic hairspray chipping on these uh, but it was tough uh, with these little bitty cans <laughs> they're very tiny and holding on to them while doing hairspray chipping of lacquer was not the easiest thing. Um, I actually ended up doing some, uh, a little bit of, ex you know, experimentation on the fly, as I sometimes do. Where I actually just, after I painted them, because I was having a hard time with the chipping, I just started spraying them with straight lacquer thinner and IPA and just kind of gradually washing paint off with my airbrush. And it was actually a little bit more controlled than it sounds, maybe not even, you know, maybe not quite as crazy as it sounds. And I kind of liked the effect because it gave me a sort of a rubbed off look, you know, up there around the handles and the, uh, the caps. So anyway, it's so tiny and it's pretty subtle. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one reason that um, as with every one of these smaller scale projects that I've done over the last year or two <laughs> that I am, I have firmly decided I will never do this again at this scale. Because the truth is that I'm basically doing everything that I would do at a larger scale. It's just that it's way more of a pain in the ass because it's so tiny. I mean, I got mad respect for anybody who does this stuff and lives at 148th scale with armor. And definitely guys like Alex Clark who live there at one, you know, at 172nd. But it just ain't going to be for me. I just, you know, yeah. It takes me just as long. Uh, I think, to do it at a smaller scale, but it is more stressful and frustrating. But anyway, enough whining. There's the tools. Um, I just, you know, used uh, my, I've got a selection of mission models and AK third generation uh, acrylics that I use for brush painting, as well as the uh, really lovely uh, pro acryl met uh, metallic acrylic colors. And that's what all I, I used on these tools. And I'm actually, you know, not too unhappy with the way they turned out. I think they'll pass. Um, I know that, you know, they might have been painted over. I guess there's different ideas about that. And that I really should have shown the paint, like, chipped off of them. But I'm really kind of overall going for a higher contrast look with this thing. You know, that's something that I still search for. I don't want to be quite as high contrast as say Martin, you know, Uncle Night Shift, but I don't want to be like perfectly realistic in terms of contrast either. This is something I've always struggled with with my photography. And it seems like the amount of contrast that I like sort of depends on the day of the week or what kind of mood I'm in, which can be a real hassle because <laughs> I like what I did today, but that doesn't mean I'm going to love it tomorrow. So, but overall, what I want, if you're familiar with any of the, you know, some of the more famous photographers of the 20th century, one of my photo photography heroes is a guy named Steve McCurry. Um, if you remember the photograph of the Afghan girl that was famous on the cover of National Geographic back in the 90s, he's that guy. And I, and I really kind of want my work to feel like one of his images. It's realistic, but it's rich and bold and uh, anyway, whatever. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. Got some cat hairs on there too. Anyway, that's what's going on up there. Uh, I, <laughs> I've heard some people talk about, um, it, I mean, you see this regularly. People will talk about their flat coats and how they'll sometimes get this white blush. And um, I, look, I think it happens to all of us, and I don't think it necessarily depends on the material. I'm convinced that um, it's really uh, a, 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 a result of spraying a little bit too wet, and the material will pool there, and that will, for whatever reason, cause 
the talc or whatever the flattening agent is to sort of collect. And straight up, that's what happened to me right here on this wheel. This is MRP uh, Super Clear Matte. And I just, yeah, I got a little ham fisted, but I kind of like the effect. Call it a Bob Ross happy accident, but I'm leaving it. I sort of like it. So um, that's what's happened there. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway, so you can see all the pieces are in place. Um, everything is painted and kind of, you know, going back to what I talked about with, with, with seeking a higher contrast look. Right now, most of the washes are just Tamiya black panel line accent. I tend to use that on aircraft for functional panel lines, you know, things like doors, hatches, anything that could get moved or removed. Um, I like to use that to sort of tell that story. And they kind of all ended up being that way on this. I did mix up some dark olive drab oils and do a little bit of... of uh, I worked with that a little bit in some places like around this detail on the fender. Um, you know, just kind of around the top here to sort of show that, you know, as this paint has gotten a little bit oxidized, uh, but, you know, when you walk on it, it's going to... Uh, you're, you're going to see the darker paint underneath. Some of that also is just a result of just like dust, but... Bottom line is, I just wanted to show a little bit of foot traffic up here. I used it a little bit, uh, you know, in areas where I just wanted to get a little bit more relief. Again, building in contrast, but not as much as I would have if I'd used, you know, something like black. So, like, I went in to that area underneath the mantlet there and darkened that, kind of darkened it around the hooks, darkened it around the details on the front of the mantlet, mantlet just to, again, just give it a little more, just a little more pop, a little more interest. You can see that I have uh, got a name here on the barrel uh, that's hand painted with Liquitex white ac acrylic ink. And, uh, you know, somebody challenged me on whether or not these guys were painting names on their gun tubes. And the answer is absolutely. I've got quite a few pictures that show that. And um, I kind of like that hand-painted look. Um, <laughs> it's so weird how stuff goes from left to right. This one, I painted first try. On the other side, <laughs> it took me three tries to get that one. I didn't want it to match, but I also didn't want it to be look, you know, look completely different either. So anyway, I got the look that I was after. I'm stoked about that. The uh, Freedom Dispenser is all painted up, and I'm pretty happy with the way it looks. Um, but at the same time, even as cool as it is, it's still 148th scale, and it's tough. I tried to use a little bit of the uh, uh, Acryl uh, Silver to uh, dry brush and, and pick up some of those details that are so amazing. And I don't know, it helped a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it just is what it is. It's just tiny. The uh, tarps, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the tarps. Uh, James Rice busted my chops and said, you know, they look a little sloppy and out of place, and I don't think he's wrong. But I also don't think that I have the skill to really do it much better. Somebody also commented on the, you know, black outlines for the shadows being a little harsh. I'm like, well, and that's not wrong. But again, I was kind of going for high contrast. So probably just going to let those be. There may be a little dust on them by the time it's all said and done, but we'll see how that evolves. One thing I'm not going to do is put a rope on them because, I, you know, I get why everybody wants to use ropes. And if there was a bunch of other stuff stacked up there, I would. But a couple of heavy canvas tarps on a vehicle that's never going to go probably more than 25 miles an hour, those things ain't moving. So I'm not going to bother with a rope for the tarps. However, I probably am going to put a rope through the handles of all the gas cans because they uh, probably would have been secured by some conscientious tanker. Um, I think I talked in the previous clip about the uh, sort of confusion... Um, I don't know, maybe I didn't anyway, but there were quite a few people who looked at the, at the applique armor 
and thought that it was wood, which was baffling to me because, you know, of course, I worked so hard to, uh, you know, produce those welds and uh, call them out with a little bit of silver paint. And, you know, bottom line was that if you wanted to read correctly, then, you you know, it's kind of your job as the, as the producer to do as much as you can to make that happen. So I went back and and added a little bit more silver to those. I will probably also do a little bit of rust streaking, but what I'm really counting on is that this little shelf here, being that it is obviously a piece of rusty steel channel, will sort of tie it all together. People will look at that and they'll go, oh, okay, I get it, I see that, and then I see this, I get it. Like, you know, hopefully it happens within a, a few seconds and your brain recognizes what's going on, but. Anyway, we'll see. I uh, went ahead and also did wash down here on the running gear to pick out those details. Again, pretty high contrast. But a lot of that's also going to get covered up. Maybe all of it by the time the dust and, and dirt uh, is, is complete. What I'm kind of going to go for with this, and I told Spud Murphy I'm blatantly going to copy his method and his 1 16th scale Sherman that he just did but is basically what I've grown up around, which is the got dusty, got rained on, got muddy, got washed off, got dusty again, etc. at, you know, on and on and on, uh, sort of look that uh, farm equipment gets from just years of sitting outside and being exposed to the elements and never getting an actual bath. So, that's gonna be next, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll, you know, hopefully that'll go good. But for now, it's all painted and ready for the next stages. Okay, so there you go. Hopefully, <laughs> you know, as always, I hope that this has been uh, interesting and at least somewhat informative, and you can kind of see how I'm stepping through my decision-making process when it comes to picking colors. I really. Truthfully, I'm just trying to make this thing look good. This is my first ever actual tank project, and I really have no idea what I'm doing. I'm looking to, uh, you know, modelers like Spud Murphy and Sam Dwyer and Tracy Hancock and, you know, some of these guys that are just really way more experienced at this than I am for inspiration, and hopefully I will not embarrass myself too badly. But then again, we've all been told recently that nobody is being innovative enough in armor modeling and that everybody was better at it 10 years ago. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe this is just going to be one big disaster. I have no idea, but I am kind of excited about moving into the part of the project where I get to play in the dirt, which uh, if you've ever watched any of my stuff, you know is... One of my favorite things. So, if uh, you're interested, then by all means, please stay tuned for the next episode. That should wrap up this whole little series. But, as always, for whatever you've watched or will watch, will watched? <laughs> anyway, you know the deal. I appreciate you watching. Much love.